Bibles in this church if you do not have a Bible you're going to hell <laughs> I'm just kidding um, let's turn our Bibles in the book of Esther Esther how many of you know how many of you know someone named Esther not really a popular name is it but Esther is a really beautiful name I think if I have another daughter <laughs> um, Esther Esther I am <laughs> kind of awkward but turn the Bible to the book of Esther. We're sounding awfully quiet today, this morning. We're in a great church. Is it the fasting or your what? We should be energized. We only have what? Six more days left. Six more days and we got to... We got to kill a cow. Tear it apart. Get it. Flash, flash. <laughs> Esther, forgive us, Americans. <laughs> Esther chapter 4, and we are continuing, of course, this series. We call it Zero Dark 21 because of the 21 days that we are fasting together. And some of you have probably heard the first time that we are fasting. But we are fasting, what we're doing is a Daniel fast. A Daniel fast. And Daniel fast is a biblical concept in the Bible. When in the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel fasted for 21 days. And he abstained from any kind of meat or rich foods. Meaning he abstained from anything that comes from an animal. Whether it's by ground or by sea. Just focus his diet on vegetables. <laughs> Alright? Vegetables and uh, grains and all that. And nothing from the animal. And... We always do this every year, but this year has been really important part of our prayer fast. And last Friday, we had an amazing time praying together. Church, can you hear me now? We pray for the church, we pray for our direction, we pray for what our next three to five years will look like. Asking God, seeking God, God, what can you grow in me? I ask you what you want to see the church look like in the next three or five years. You see, that's of course, we want to see it grow, we want to see it do bigger things. But we have to understand that bigger things requires bigger responsibility. And before you ask God for something bigger, you got to be prepared for it. Can you hear an amen? The Bible says, actually, the Paul, Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, the last chapter, he says, when I was a child, I speak like a child. But when I grow up, I put away all the childish things. I remember when I was a kid, I was playing with the wrestling uh, toys. How many of you wrestling fans here? 90s, Ultimate Warrior, yes. Robert James Dick, right? Uh, who's that? Who's that other guy? Uh, oh, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, right? I, I have a whole collection of that, and I always ask my dad if every time there's something new coming up, I will buy it. But guess what? When a girl notices me, or start noticing me, and they start pursuing me, the girls, calling my home, it's right there, you know, and I'm like, you know, my parents are strict. I'm not. So when I get to that age, you know, I cannot be seen playing with toys anymore, right? You gotta start looking good and, and doing all those things. As a church, there's a time that God's going to call us all together to grow. To grow together, to mature together in our walk with our, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in this story that we're going to look at today, Esther is a really, really, really nice story in the Bible. Actually, a lot of movies have taken the King and I. If you heard of that movie, it's actually kind of get the concept of Esther because Esther was a Jewish woman born during the time of captivity, which last week we talked about how many years they were in captives. Say 70. 70. 70 years. The people of Israel were in Babylon in captivity. Why? Because they do wicked things. And God says, Enough is enough. I'm going to let you be driven out and you will be in captives. And Esther was born during that time of 70 years. And she was a Jewish woman. And not only that, the Bible says that she was blessed with beautiful physique. 
How many of you ladies here believe that you are blessed with beautiful physique? Liar! Liar! You don't think you're blessed with beautiful physique? That's what you tell yourself every morning when you wake up. Because she was beautiful, she called attention to the eye of the king, Circes, during that time. Are you guys following me? And so, when the king noticed her, because she was so beautiful, she's very pretty, gorgeous, the king made her one of his queens, or one of his concubines, or one of his wives. And so she became a queen. And so here, there are just three characters that I want you guys to remember. Are you with me? The first character, of course, is Esther. Say Esther. Esther. Or the person that should say Esther. Esther. Actually, we're going to divide you. You're going to be Esther. Say, hey. 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 Esther. <laughs> You're going to be Haman. Hey. Go like this, okay? Hey. Haman. Hey. Hey. Okay, let's do it together. Ready, set, go. Hey. 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 You're going to be Mordecai. Mordecai. Okay? Mordecai is like this. Mordecai. Mordecai. <laughs> I love this. This is the first thing I want to Okay? Who are you guys going to be? Mordecai. <laughs> okay, this is? Yes. You're Esther. Hey. You guys, you guys are. Hey. And you are. This is all that you guys are. I see sister. I see sister. Esther, Haman, Mordecai. Those are the three major characters because Haman was promoted. He was given the authority during that time under the king's services. And the king decreed that Haman, everyone that sees him, who's Haman? Haman. Everyone that sees Haman will bow down. That was the king's decree because he was given all authority during that time. So Haman was walking one time, and then Mordecai, say Mordecai. Mordecai. Okay, you don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Mordecai, Mordecai refused to bow down to him. Haman took it personally and found out that Mordecai was a Jew. And so he came to the king and says, King, there is a group of people, and this happens. Can you hear that? Sometimes a whole race get judged just by one person. And by the way, division is from the devil. Racism is from the devil. And if you study the Bible, God did not divide us by color. God divided us by language. You study the book of Genesis in the Tower of Babel. When they built the tower, God says, oh, this is not good. The whole world speaks one language. They can do whatever they want. And they're all sinners. So imagine. If they can do whatever they want, they communicate to each other, they got to do wicked things. And so God says, I'm going to send something, confuse their language, and by their language, it was all divided. That's from the Bible. We're not divided by God. But here, Haman find out that Mordecai was a Jew. And so he came to the king and says, King, there's this group of people that is not going to bow down to you. They are a threat to your kingdom. And so here's what I will propose to you. Why don't you issue a decree? And the decree is when a king signs something and sealed it with his ring finger. That means even himself cannot change it. And so Haman persuaded the king to, fight, to, to give a decree to wipe away the whole Jewish people. Everyone. Young, old, everyone will be killed. And he persuaded the king and told the king that king from a year from now sign this decree 
and I will make it happen. And I will donate all this money, this all this silver, to your treasury for it. And so the king says, sounded good. What the king did not know was one of his concubines, or one of his queen, Esther, was a wife. This is huge. And because God was upon Esther, in a way, he got, he was, she was the apple of the eye of the king. God understand Babylonians, pagans, they have many wives. But the king specifically had that failings. That failings with Esther. Have you guys know what I'm talking about? Failings. Have you ever had failings with someone before? Huh? I had failings with someone before. I married her. Huh? So she had failings with Esther. And then when Haman finally finalized that, Mordecai found out about the plan. And here's the thing, here's the twist. Mordecai and Esther are cousins. Oh. Not only that, and when Esther lost her parents, Mordecai became a father figure to her. Are we following the story? Okay, that's it. Next week. <laughs> so Esther, now we can see the story taken. If you're Mordecai, and here's your cousin, pretty much your daughter, is the queen to the king. And now you know that all the Jewish people will die. What would you do? You would talk to Esther. Because only Esther can talk to the king. Can I hear anyone? But then again, there's another twist in this one. <laughs> Alright? Do I have to tell you? Yes. Do I have to tell you? Yes. Well, convince me first. Do I have to tell you? Yes. How do you ask? Please. <laughs> you guys know, this is what I ask my children. Dad, I'm like, especially my dad. Milk! Calm down, woman. How do you ask? Please, Daddy. I said, your milk is just right there. No, you can't. Eat. <laughs> but since you said please, I'm going to tell you another twist in the story. The twist in the story is this. Esther was not summoned by the king. Meaning, the king has to call her to see her. But while the king is in the palace, no one, say no one, Turn the person next to say no one. Oh. No one can see the king unannounced. Anyone who shows up to the palace without you being summoned by the king is punishable by death. And so Esther told Mordecai, I would love to talk to my Baby, baby, baby. <laughs> well, I like to talk to my baby, but I gotta get killed to show up. <laughs> and what I want you guys to pay attention to in this story is what part the prayer and fasting do when it comes to seeking God. What comes the prayer and fasting do when the people of God is put in the place that they have to respond. And there is not much time left. Here's one of the things I require you this morning. There is a time, such a time in your life, where comfort is not going to cut it anymore. There is a time in your life that God is going to call you out, out of what is comfortable, and God's going to challenge you, based on your response, I will respond. No more waiting on me because I know already what I'm going to do. I already know what I'm going to do. But what are you going to do? There's a time in your life that God is going to have a genuine calling for you. Amen. And the 
challenge for you is God, am I going to respond? Ten years ago, I was sitting in a class, a school named ITT College. How many of you heard of that? I was one semester away from graduating my master's and doctors at the same time. I'm just kidding. It was only associates. associates. It's not exactly a little bit. And I remember sitting in the class. Class starts at 7 p.m. I got there about 6.30, just chatting with my classmate. And a genuine call. Oh God, clearly, this is not where I want you to be, right? you know where I want you to be. For a few months, God has been working in my heart, telling me I want you to enroll in a Bible school. I want you to study my word. During that time, it was never like, I'm going to call you to be a very handsome pastor. Like that. I mean, you know, I'm kind of giving them. I sat there, sat there, waited, waited till the class starts until God says, this is not where I want you. I left that class before it starts. Never look back. And I'm here today. Amen. Looking back, talk to my friends, talk to some mentors. They say, you could have finished it and then go. That would be have been okay with God. But I said, but that wasn't what God said. God said, now. God said, that time. Such a time. A moment in time where God, you're going to hear God's voice clearly and very much in your conviction, you know that it could have not come from anything else, that it got to come from God. And God's going to say, come on, stop to you respond. A time as this that I believe God is continually calling His people day after day. But how many times have we let that opportunity pass by? How many of us here today can say, I've had opportunities pass by? Can you hear me? Amen. How opportunities pass by? I thought there's something more, but I kind of have that feeling that that time, that was it. That that time, that was it. That was that moment that God's calling me for such a time as this. Esther was put in a place and in a time where God is saying, I created you for such a time as this. Everything, church, when we come together and when we understand that we are not here just by ourselves, that we are submitted to, to the plan of God, there's such a time where God's going to say, I'm going to call you. What is going to be your answer? And here's what I believe. Some of you here today already know what I'm talking about. Some of you here today, God has been having that conversation with you and telling you something and calling you. And you're like, oh, I don't know if that's really God. I don't know if that's God. That's God. That's God. There's a calling in your life that only God, the voice of God, can whisper it to you. Can you hear me? Look at Esther chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, what did he do? He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's what? Gate while wearing clothes of mourning. Each and every day, verse 3, and as the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was a great mourning among the Jews. Jews. They what? Fasted. What did they do? Fasted. They fasted. They what? Wept and well. Imagine if, if, if there's a decree that says all Filipinos go home. <laughs> Back to where you come from. What do you think is going to happen to us? No exceptions. All Filipinos go home. We're all going to start praying and all fasting. River pictures, we fast and pray because there's a call. There's a need. There's a time for us to seek God. 
There's a time for us to ask God for direction. And there's also a challenge for us to, to challenge God to move supernaturally. Because the things that we deal with in life, the strongholds that we have in our life, guess what? You can try and try and try to overcome it. Only God can. Amen. Amen. Only God can. Amen. There are some drama in your life. And you tell your babe about it, oh babe, you know it's happening again, blah blah blah, over and over again, it keeps happening. Because you're not fighting it. And if you are, you're fighting it by your flesh. The Bible says we are all in the spiritual warfare. Let God fight your battles. Can you hear that? Let God fight your battles. Submit it to God and let God say, God, this is yours. And the people of Israel understood this. And they said, we are now, we have our backs against the wall. What are we going to do? Who are we going to talk to? We're going to come to anybody else. The only person we can go to now is who? God. How do we do that? We fast. And we pray. And look what it says there. We're going to jump to verse 9. And Mordecai sent a messenger to Esther and told Esther everything that had happened, all the plan, every single detail, even the amount of money that was given for that decree to happen. And in verse 9, Hatach came back and related Mordecai's word to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hatach and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of king's provinces know that for any man, or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, but he be put to, to death. What Esther is saying, here's our problem, Mordecai. I would want to see the king, except if I go there unannounced, by law, they will kill me. By law, they will kill me. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where it seems like, God, there's no more options? Can you hear me? Like you really think like, oh man, the devil, it's checkmate, you won. But God says, no, wait a minute. It's not over until I said it's over. It's not over until God says, yep, yeah, it's over. And here, Look what it says, but Esther says, it says, unless the golden scepter, unless he holds up his hand in his golden scepter, and the king has not called for me to come to him in what? In 30 days. I haven't seen him in 30 days. You know what Esther is saying? I don't know how he's going to react. I don't know how he's going to respond. But look at verse 13. I want you guys to get this for the church. Because some of us here today, this message is exactly for us. Some of us here have been waiting and waiting and waiting, and God says, it's your time. You are created in such a time as this. How many watch that movie? I'm going to be careful how I said it. Armageddon? Armageddon. How do you say it? Armageddon. What does it mean? <laughs> Armageddon. You know who's in that movie? Bruce Willis. And at the end of the movie, they dig and dig and dig to plant the nuclear because the asteroid was going to hit the earth. And so they got diggers, they got oilers to do their job, to be astronauts. They dig and dig and finally they reach their death. They drop the bomb. They're all getting ready to leave. And then what happens? The bomb cannot go off. What is the solution? They, are, they have about 10 seconds. And the solution is one of them has to stay behind. And guess what? They cast lots, it fell on Ben Affleck. Okay? And it happens that Ben Affleck was engaged to Bruce Willis' son. 
I mean dog. dog. <laughs> erase that, erase that. <laughs> Bruce Willis' daughter. And then when Ben Affleck was about to go, Bruce Willis says, no, it's my turn. He stayed behind. And if you remember that scene, just when Bruce Willis was about to press the trigger, what happened? Everything that happened in his life started to flash back. Everything. From having a daughter, from being married, from all this, everything happened for his life. And lead up to that moment of such a time as this. God, listen to this River Faith Church. God is going to call you where everything, say everything, everything. where everything that has happened in your life up to this point and when it began, it all going to lead up to this calling. It's all going to lead up to such a time as this when God says, this is why everything happened to you for this reason. Amen. It's all going to lead up to this. And in the, in the life of Esther, she was given that calling that everything that happened to her lead up to such a time. That's why she was beautiful. That's why they were in captivity. That's why she was, she was cousins with Mordecai. All the hurts, all the pain, everything, all the unpleasant things that did not happen, everything will make sense because God will make it into sense. When I walked out that classroom, going back 10 years forward now, Everything made sense. Some of you here today are asking, God, why am I going through this? God, why am I this? God, why this? God's saying, because all of those are ingredients to this one I'm cooking for you. And guess what? When you hear that kettle whistling, how many of you have that kettle that whistles? When it's... Right, right? You hear it, right? Or something like that. You know it's time. You know it's cooked. God says, Esther, Mordecai, look what Mordecai says. Verse 13. Then Mordecai said, reply to Esther, don't you think for a moment that you're in a place on the palace you will escape when all the Jews are killed? Do you think that being in your comfort zone God's going to accomplish greater things to you. Do you think that in your comfort zone, you're going to be able to accomplish many things? God says, no, I'm going to call you out of your comfort zone. Well, God, it's not going to be easy. That's why it's called not comfort zone. <laughs> because comfort zone is what we want. Can you hear that? Outside the comfort zone is everything that God wants. And here's how we define bad. Things I don't like. Can I hear an amen? Can I hear an amen? If something happens to me that I don't like, it's bad. Some of us here got broken hearted. Some of us here got sick. Some of us here got bit of addiction. Some of us here have been through the worst days in their lives. But let me tell you this. It was through them that Jesus saved their lives. What you think sometimes is bad, it's not really bad. It was a preparation for such a time as this. Every faith church is easy to be comfortable. Is that your name? It can be here. Just be comfortable. But what if God is telling us, no, but that's why your name it's not the river. It's not the pond of faith. <laughs> or aquarium of faith. <laughs> right? Yes. Or what do you call those? Potholes? Is it potholes? Puddle. Puddle? Yeah. Or not a puddle of faith. <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe we should change our name. Puddles of faith. <laughs> uh, Notice why your name is 
river. You know what, what river is like? I suggest in Kimberley. You think about it. No, really. Thank you. And there's another one. It says your love is like a river. So peaceful and deep. Your soul is like a sea. <laughs> Do not imagine that you are in the king's palace can escape any more of the Jews. Verse 14. I always challenge, God always challenged me, Ray, there's, there's an easy way. There's what you think is the right way. And there's the Jesus way. Are you with me? Every time you you get into conflict. Every time something you don't like happens to you, which you define as bad, what your, re your reaction is between those three lines. Are you with me? You can react by saying, I want the easy way, which is what? I quit. I walk away. I leave. I just go. Or, if you got hurt, I retaliate. I fight back. I do this. I hear an amen? I say 99.9% .9 of the time, we resort to what? The easy way. Right? You're too sensitive. Someone's been said to you, you got offended. Sensitive means sensitive. First thing you do is, I quit. I walk away. Right? Yeah, yeah, give me my back. <laughs> right? That's what you do. And then there's what you think is right, which is also the easy way. <laughs> it's just a different way. Well, I prayed about it. No, you did not. That's still your way. And then there's Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ says, somebody stop you in your cheek, give them the other with a left hook. <laughs> Here's my allergy. <laughs> God said, Jesus said, you stop in one cheek, give it the other. Jesus Christ says, you've been heard that you should hate your enemies. What did Jesus Christ say? Love your enemies. Jesus is way, necessarily me, the easy way. But guess what? It is the way where your calling is fulfilled. Are you with me? Look what it says here. Look what it says in verse 14. For if you remain silent, say silent. Silent. People who love to stay on the comfort zone, what do they do? They remain silent. You don't bother me. I don't bother you. I just stay here, do my thing. And we don't do each other. That's the easiest way. Now sometimes what God's going to tell you to do will bother other people. Sometimes what God's going to call you to do will irritate other people. But guess what? God says, don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. Here's a pill called Nanyan. Have you guys ever had Nanyan pill? Have you guys ever had Nanyan Pill? You never heard of Nanyan Pill? Nanyan Business. <laughs> if there are some people that are trying to tell you something, you know, hey, you know what? I, I got this new pill. It's, it's, it's called Nanyan. <laughs> Just give them the Nanyan Pill. It's Nanyan Business. God says, what I'm calling you to do is stand up your business to other people. I'm calling you to do it because I have a plan for it. <coughs> and if you don't do it, I'll find someone else. There's a time in your life where God's going to call you out, out of your comfort zone. And you can either stay silent, or you can either say, God, whatever it is, I'll do. Verse 14. For if you remain silent, this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from other place. But you know 
but you and your relatives will die. You're going to die anyway. Because that decreases all the Jews. Who knows? Say who knows? Who knows? Perhaps you were created for such a time as this. Perhaps you are created for such a time as this. Perhaps God called us for such a time as this. Everything that has happened in your life come to a point and lead up to the point where God is saying, everything that happened is because of this moment. This is the moment. There are times in our lives that God is going to call us and we're going to have that. This is the moment. Time. In our life. There are three things I want to share with you guys this morning. First one, we always say this. God's timing is perfect. Right? We always say that, right? No, God's timing is perfect. But you know what? It just didn't happen. No, then that's not God's timing. Because this is what I'm going to tell you. God's timing is not only perfect. It always prevails. Mordecai told Esther, if you step up out of your comfort zone, and if you decide not to remain silent, then God will use you for such a time as this. And you will fulfill the purpose why you have become queen. But guess what too? If you remain silent, deliverance will come out from some other place. What God is saying, it's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. God's plan is sovereign. Say sovereign. Meaning he knows already what the plan is. The problem with us as God's people, we are very slow to get to the agenda. We are very slow to read the memo. We are very slow to see what God is doing. That's why sometimes we look at each other and we look at like, is God really doing something? Yes! We're just not on it. God's timing, it is perfect. Can you hear that? Amen. You pray for someone, you want to marry, pray for someone first. And pray for God's timing to be perfect. You pray for this job, for this career, you pray for all these things. You pray for your career, for, for what you're going to do in the future. Pray for God's timing. Because everything happens in God's timing. Can you hear that? Amen. Amen. How many of you have, have decided outside God's time? I have. And most likely those decisions you're going to regret. Amen. Amen. God's time is not only perfect, it is always prevail. Number two. And this is one thing I want all of us to do. Everything you are and everything you are not will lead up to such a time. All your questions. All your questions. How come that girl hurt me? How come he left me? How come this happened? How come that, this, 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 God? How come you allow this to happen? How come all these things happen to me? It will lead up to such a time where everything that God created that you are, and here's one thing too, and what you are not. And let me say this. We also be all be thankful for, for who God created us to be not. What I mean by that? Many times we always compare ourselves to someone else. Can I hear an amen? amen. Oh, I want to be that person. God, I, I wish I had his abs. <laughs> oh, you're always at Korean barbecue. You're not going to have that abs. <laughs> I had that conversation with God, and God's like, mm -hmm. Wow, I wish I had that, I wish I had this. God says, I created you. You never read it in the Bible, God told Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go to this place to be like Moses. And you never, had, you never heard God had conversation with Moses. 
And God says, Moses, I want you to be like David. And David, I want you to be like Joshua. Joshua, I want you to be like Caleb. Paul, I want you to be like Mark. Matthew, I want you to be like Luke. You have to understand that when God calls you, He knows everything about you. Are you with me? Say everything. I-R-V. Let's say that again. Everything. He knows everything. Do we pass safe even my darkest secrets? Yes! All your secrets and everything else. God knows it. Everything that stinks in your life. The darkest secrets, the darkest times in your life. God knows it and yet He loves you. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine what kind of trust God does every day? We only see it on the news. God knows everything about Amen. it. That's why you don't ever judge as if you know it. You don't know anything. We don't know anything. Only God sees everything. You know Amen. Amen. Imagine how many people are oppressed, how many jobs are abused, sexually molested, how many people are killed, how many things that's going on around the world, and God sees it every day. And yet, He loves us. And yet, God loves you. The guilt that God, that, that, that is in your heart, that's from the devil. That's from the devil telling you lies and telling you, I'm oh, never going to be good, man. See, you show up this church on Sunday, guess what? Next Sunday, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's life in the devil. Because you know what? God knows every little thing about you and still loves you. Bible says even the count of your hairs, He knows it. That's how much God knows you. And the point of this is, everything that happens in your life will lead up to such a time where God's going to call you and ask you to respond. Pastor, how do I know that God's calling? It will be confirmed by His word. It will be confirmed by His Word. God will never tell you something that is against His Word. I don't know. You know, God will never tell you, okay, you can punch now your supervisor. <laughs> You've been wanting to do that for a long time. God will never tell you such a thing as that. Lastly, it goes with this. How many of you heard that expression, when the rubber meets the road? How many of you heard that expression before? No? Oh, the Filipinos. How many of you heard the expression, kung may chaga, may pagod? But, may machaga, may pagod. <laughs> you know the expression called when rubber meets the road, meaning that is when it becomes real. Every faith church here is just I want to close with you guys today. We can fast about it, we can pray about it, but if we don't act on it, that's gonna happen. How many of you heard something bad happen to someone and said, well, I'll pray for you? Guess what happens? Now I'm not saying praying for someone is not good. When someone is bleeding to death right in front of you, and you say, let's pray for God, but you don't act on it, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. Remember, God is making it simple. First week we talk about how God is speaking to us. Our second week we talk about how people got fasted and prayed under Ezra. But this next last week of our fasting, God is just challenging us. How are we gonna respond? 
How are we going to respond as a church? How are we going to be a light to this community? How many of you know someone right now who's sick? Almost half of us. How many of you know someone right now who's depressed? I know someone. How many of you know someone right now who's hurt? I know someone. There's so much need in the church more than just the Sunday that we see it every Sunday. Can I hear amen? That is what we all want to see that God is telling us that church, yes, it's good, we come here, but when the rubber meets the road is when people start responding to God's call. When God started to steal up some hearts and we as a church understand that there is a burden to carry. There is a burden that we all have to carry together so that we can move on together. It's never meant to be one man's job. It's never meant to be just one person's job. That's why the Bible describes a church to be a body. Because where your body goes, where everybody goes. And the challenge for us this morning is as simple as this, River Faith Church. What is going to be our response? Because God is going to speak. God is going to direct. God is going to challenge each one of you. Challenge your commitment. Challenge your relationship with Him. Challenge you to mature with your walk with God. There's a time and place for everything. And there is a time where God is going to look up to you straight in the eye. And He's going to tell you, now is the time. It's now time to put the childish things away and it is now time to grow up. Amen. It is now time to take it really seriously what you say to me. When you tell me that you love me. When you tell me that you want to serve me. When you tell me that I am a Christian. Bearing the name of Jesus Christ. We will faith church, the challenge for us is simple. God is calling us, calling you, and asking you, what if you are created for such a time as this? Esther replied, and we close this first verse, verse 15 to 17. The Lord says. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather all the Jews of Susa to what? Again, the fast and prayer. So fast for me. What did, this, what did she say? Do not eat or drink for? Three days. Night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then... Though it is against the law, I will go to see the king. If I must die, I must die. You can read the whole but the moment that the king saw Esther, what did he do? He raised up the scepter. And it says, then if they're coming, that's my girl. What's bothering me? She told the king everything. And now, because the Jewish people were preserved, guess what happens? Guess what happens because the Jewish people was preserved? Do you know what happened? There was this one man from the line of David from the line of Abraham. You know what his name is? His name is Jesus. From the line of Abraham, the God says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to all the nations. And out of your land, the Messiah will come. 
guess if that lie was God, then the word of God is not true. But because that lie was preserved. And throughout that story, God is using people who will say, God, I will go. If I must suffer, I must suffer. But I will have the courage to go. You were faith, church? Six more days left of fasting. After six more days of fasting, very much surely we'll all go back to our normal routines, normal eating habits and everything else, which is fine. But what happened during that 21 days? What did God do to us during that 21 days? What did God speak to us during that 21 days? It's very important. Are we going to respond? Or are we going to keep quiet? Let's all stand together and pray. Father, seeing this morning, Lord, I offer you my life. I wonder how true, truly this is. But Lord, I know there are people here that might be hurting today. People here that's looking for a direction. And people are just struggling with guilt and all these things. Lord, you remind us today that you are in control of our lives. And you have a calling for us, each of one of us, for such a time as this. Where you called us to get out of the comfort zone and to respond. And I'm praying now, Lord, for our church. I pray for everyone here. Lord, I desire to respond to you. I desire to sing this song. Lord, we offer you our lives. Lord, challenge us. What this song really means to us. What, what does it mean to us to tell you, God, I give you my life, I give you my soul, and I live for you alone. Because at the end of this fasting, God, all that's going to happen, Lord, is what you have spoken and what we are called to do. And our prayer, Lord God, that we may all respond as Esther is. So with that said, Lord, as a worshiping our forward. Let's sing a portion of this song that we sing earlier. And the song says, Lord, I offer you my life. I live for you alone. And we, many times we, we hear the song, we sing it. I just want this song just to meditate in our hearts as we end today. And I want this to be a personal song that we're all going to sing. Some of you, it's fine if you do know the words, but I want you just to listen to the words of this song. Where it says, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, and I live for you alone. Can we just play that? God, we 
say, God, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I want you to think about what are you telling to God? What are we telling to God? And what it really means to us. Now let's sing this song like a prayer. Let's just keep it really mellow.
see this all. God is on the move, amen? Yeah. Is God really on the move? Yeah. Yeah. When God is on the move, we need to respond. Amen? Yeah. Come on, let's sing this last song. Let's give glory to God for the last time. Come on, let's sing this song. God is on the move. So, and someone says, I'm gonna 